Hi, we're back. This is Dave Vellante of Wikibon.org, and this is theCUBE, SiliconANGLE's continuous coverage. Uh, this is Big Data Week. We were at IO, uh, IOD, IBM's IOD, on Monday and Tuesday. We're here at Strata, Wednesday and Thursday. Uh, we're here live in New York. And uh, this is where all the Hadoop crowd gathers, the big data crowd, the data scientists, the BI professionals, the new platform guys, the startups, the big whales trying to get a big piece of that pie. It's just, it's the place to be for, for big data. Um, and we're here with George Matthew, who's the president and COO of Alterix. Uh, George is a CUBE alum, welcome back. It's been a while. It's been a while, but good to see you again, Dave. And Thanks uh, for having me. Yeah, we were just talking about, you know, last time we had you on was at, at Sapphire. It was Sapphire and 2010, uh, yeah. And wow, was it was, it was I know the CUBE's come a long ways. It has, <laughs> it's, and it's uh, uh, <laughs> quite, a, quite an operation here you've got. Yeah, well thank you, and uh, well, we've also seen the, the evolution of the whole big data business. I mean, at Sapphire 2010, as you remember, mm -hmm. we heard we heard about HANA, uh, not much about big data. In fact, I think Bill McDermott might have mentioned it once mm -hmm. in one of his keynotes. Mm -hmm. And then this year, maybe you heard it 20, 30, 40, 50 times. You know, yep. SAP's more about fast data. Yes. But, yeah. but boy, we've heard the term big data here a lot. Uh, yep. As I say, the industry's evolved. Everybody's kind of redefining things. I mentioned I was at IBM IOD. Uh, IBM's super gluing its analytics business to yep. the term big data. So yep. everybody's in, yep. in the business. Um, so how you doing? Great. I, you know, we are right in the middle, in my view, of the third inning of a nine-inning ball game around big data and analytics. And for me, I started to see how infrastructure has largely started to evolve in this space. To think about big data today, it's much less about what the infrastructure around Hadoop and MySQL looks like because that's actually played itself out in the first three innings of the ball game. But at the same time, people are now trying to understand what the business value is, what the outcomes are, how to make analytics more consumable, more approachable to a broader set of users. And that's what we're doing at Alteryx. We see ourselves as an analytic engine that can enable people to consumerize big data faster and cheaper and more efficiently than anything else in the market. So you got a long history at Alteryx in, in BI. Yes. You started Yes. At a time, you kind of started before the Enron debacle, yes. back yes. when you know BI people yeah, were putting yeah. forth this promise yeah, yeah. of uh. 360 degrees views of the business and cubes and all that other good stuff, and and it's sort of that whole industry um, became one of largely of reporting, yep. sort of looking back in the rearview mirror, and the big data business has has completely changed that. It um, has. Talk it about has. that a little. Yeah. Bit. So when you look at where. The change in the market has occurred, and you know, m having my experience been at Business Objects as many years as I was, and saw how a BI stack was largely about a data warehouse ETL and business reporting, dashboarding on top of it, the challenge for the analytics space, it's not about being able to distribute a report to hundreds of thousands of users. The challenge is how do you take all of the data that you need from inside the firewall, from outside the firewall, from social media sources, from cloud sources, package that and productize that in a way where you can get consumable insights out of it and share that to a broader set of users. And by the way, you want to be able to structure a solution where the single person, the data scientist, the data artist, and the data analyst, they can actually be the ones that are conveying results. So the biggest difference I see between the world of BI and analytics is that BI is about reporting the past. Analytics is really about thinking how a analyst or a data scientist convey the not too distant future and give results of what the next best decision should be as opposed to reporting for hundreds of thousands of users of what the past was. Yeah, I mean, I've been maybe unfairly critical of the whole BI space and to, because really those two things. One is it, it, it really was a rear view mirror looking activity yeah. and it was important, you know, especially yeah. again post Enron, uh, it became critical, but uh, on the other hand, a lot of that was compliance and just not driving a lot of real exciting business value. Right. There was some, you know, putting beer next to diapers, that was you know, yep, the famous yep, example, yep, that's, yep. that's cool, yep. but rudimentary compared to what we're talking about today. And then the other piece of that, which you touched upon, is really didn't scale. Mm -hmm. The adoption of BI was you know, very much you know, limited to those analysts that could, could you know, really do things with the data, and then yes, put, put out reports. Yep. And then I had another question, and I had to wait six, nine months, and I had to fund it, and it just wasn't the right model. Talk about how that's changing and what, what you're doing in, in terms of participating in that. Yeah, so that model's radically different uh, today now. So Dave, when you look at this market, the analyst has responsibility for making the next big critical decision. So I'll give you some examples of this. Uh, customers like McDonald's, 
when we look at how McDonald's uses analytic solutions like Alteryx, they go ahead and figure out how do they decide where they place their next store based on customer propensity, demographic insights, how much point of sale data they have, the network effect of not only where they place their current stores, but where they place competitive value to the distance of other stores. And you have to pull that all into one composite view to share to a broader set of users to decide how do you make your next decision, in this case, you know, where you open your store. And that kind of analytics is much, much different, much, much different than what is effectively a report that looks at the past. And so what we believe is you need the ability to take the analytic processing around data wherever it comes from, be able to package predictive analytics right alongside of how you package data along with the predictive capabilities and publish that as a fully formulated application to share to a broader set of users. And the importance is that you got to have it be able to be done by one person, not by a team of or staff of IT managers and members to deploy a solution in, as you've stated, nine months or a year, because you need that answer right away, instantaneously, in the hands of that end user. You know, another in interesting dynamic here, George, is that the the old world is not sitting still. I mean, they've been dis disrupted before, they've yep. seen this movie, and now they're really charging hard at this. Yep. How do you see the sort of old and the new? You're coming at it from a from a, 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 a hybrid sure. you know, version of that. Yep. Uh, you got a lot of experience in, yep. in, this, in this world. How do you see the, the sort of new fresh startups that are immature coming together with the, the big whales and again, guys like you, you know, the, the tuna yeah. <laughs> in no, the middle. Yeah, yeah. You got the, yeah. you know, the yeah. whales, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. the minnow, and you're the kind yeah. of the tuna yeah. in between. <laughs> the How do you between. see all those coming together? Well, you know, uh, anytime disruption happens in the technology industry, it doesn't happen where someone completely gets replaced Effectively, what ends up happening is that new things form alongside of the old things, right? So what we're seeing is a level of substitution. Let's give an example of this. So instead of actually doing a full-scale enterprise ETL process for your new applications that you might be standing up, what are you ending up doing? You're actually putting it inside of Hadoop, right? You're going ahead and using cheaper resources, being able to more effectively get analytics delivered to a broader set of users without having to go rely on the infrastructure of the past. So I think this is where you're not going to see the situation that Anything that's new coming into the big data and analytics world is somehow going to replace or supplant everything that was before it. It's just that you have a new opportunity to solve problems that weren't possible before, right? If you want to combine, say for instance, telephony data around wireless signal strength, drop call volumes, and combine that together with information that is text processed and analyzed from, say for instance, a call center environment and bring that together to compose a churn analytic, you couldn't actually do that. You had to rely on just the data that was inside of your call center to assume what the churn analysis was. But now you can actually combine sources of data together in a seamless way and suddenly you have a better churn analytic model. Well, it turns out that eight out of top 10 telecommunications wireless carriers in North America are using Alteryx for better churn analytics because you can do that. It's not like the BI reporting in that organization has gone away, it's just simply that we are solving a use case that hasn't been solved before. Yeah, so talk some more about the, 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 the customer use spaces. I mean, Telco's a, a, a big one because yep. of the churn. Yep. Uh, talk about how you've had business impact uh, yep. directly affecting that churn. Yeah, so uh, you know, churn is a big challenge for telecommunications companies and particularly wireless carriers today because there's no real reason why a member or a subscriber of a carrier can't actually go over to another carrier because the thing that blocked them before was number portability, right? You wanted to keep your number and if you decided to you know, change your cell phone provider, you had to get a new cell phone number. But about four or five years ago, they introduced number portability to the equation. So there's no issue in terms of your ability to leave. So you have to be competitive as a as a wireless carrier, for instance, on two fronts. One is you have to maintain a competitive ARPU, average revenue per user, and you have to be able to give valid offers to an end user the moment there is a likelihood of churn. And that's what 
solutions like Alteryx do for our customers. We actually go ahead and help them understand what is the most probable situation where you're going to run into a segment of your customers that are going to churn out, and how do you make an actionable return on that potential of churn and give a offer back to the end user so that will prevent them from going to another carrier. And so those kind of solutions where you're actually making analytics more operational, assuming that you know there is this answer that comes back faster than you know what's in your rear view mirror as far as your reporting this and is your why dashboarding those goes. Left. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, this is why those people left. That's not what you want. You want to like <laughs> stop it before they walk out the door, Dave. And that's what the that's what I see is really an opportunity in this market that's different, frankly, than where things were, you know, five, six years ago. Yeah, uh, my colleague David Floyer, we, we always have these debates about what is real time and near time and everything yep. else, and he defines it very simply. Real time is before you lose the customer. Yep, you that's know, a good so example. You're so you're participating in real time in this context. Yeah, right? and it's actually going to get even more real time as you go, right? Because look at what has been announced even at Strata, right? You know, suddenly you've got distribution providers like Cloudera starting to take largely what was a batch-based infrastructure in Hadoop and now turning that into real time with you know their Impala announcement, yeah, right. for instance. Right, so this world is now starting to drift much more towards a highly available, highly scalable, redundant environment where you could actually get analytic insights, you can get transactional processing in real time without having a lot of the infrastructure weight that held people back. And that's what's really incredible about the next five years in this space. So if you're a CIO, um, with your application portfolio, yep. let's focus on the analytics piece of the business, sure. the data warehouse infrastructure, yep. all, all that, that that piece of it. Yep. Uh, you've been investing for, for years. Uh, I've often said it's like a snake swallowing a basketball. Every new thing that comes out, you try it, you patchwork it together, um, because you see the potential. Yep. Right? And, you, and to me maintain a degree of competitiveness, you have to keep investing. So you're on this treadmill. Now all this new stuff happens, so yep. how would you advise, and I know it depends on what industry, yeah, what factors, yeah, yeah, but no. you know, generically yep. speaking, give us some horizontal you know, advice that Viewpoint we can chew on. on, on yeah. what how would you advise they, they allocate that portfolio? Yep. Think like an investment manager. Yeah. So if I was a, a CIO thinking as an investment manager, what I would actually look at is, there's the, the operations that keep my lights on from a data analytics standpoint, mostly residing in the data warehousing and ETL solutions that you've invested into. And to go out and rip and replace all of those things just doesn't make sense. But at the same time, if you're looking at ways that you handle unstructured data that you haven't been able to take advantage of before, or highly you know, petabyte scale sensor data that you know you weren't necessarily put inside a relational data warehouse. Now you have an option to have all of the things that are structured, unstructured, semi-structured, spatial, non-spatial, really doesn't matter, coexist very nicely. Now it just means that you are investing into, say for instance, NoSQL databases now, you're investing into Hadoop infrastructure, but your current investments don't have to go away, it just means that you can stand up and test these things very quickly and efficiently without spending a lot of money, right? You're, you're talking not like millions of dollars, you can actually get most of this stuff working, you know, with a few resources and very little money uh, as far as the infrastructure spend goes. What I see is that these test beds are going to become much, much more prevalent for a CIO. Their ability to try things that they haven't been able to because it was too costly to do it with their enterprise infrastructure. The, the enterprise infrastructure is the investment has been spent, it keeps the lights on for the current business, and what you are going to be able to do is have much, much more interesting test beds of activity, particularly around your data and analytics that you couldn't have before because of what's possible now. So in follow-up question, since Y2K, I mean, IT to a lot of CEOs has been a big sucking sound, yep. and we've seen IT as a percentage of revenue decline. It used yeah. to be up around you know, seven, eight percent in some industries, down yep. to you know, two to four percent, you know, depending on what you're looking at. Do you see the potential and maybe you can give some specific examples where the productivity impacts of big data analytics um, are going to be so profound that CEOs will actually start investing again in yeah, IT yeah, as a percentage yeah. of and, and have a gain yeah, share. Yeah. Well, one of the f one of the things that we talk and and see about is the the, the decline of. IT spend, right? But let's actually look at that a little more carefully because is it actually declining? I don't think it is, and here's why, right? What I think is actually happening right now is that the 
discretionary spend that a CIO has on basically capital expenditures is going down the tubes, right? Because you don't have a lot of money to put more CapEx investitures other than keeping the lights on for the stuff that you've already invested in, the non-discretionary side of things. At the same time, the line of business is actually using their OPEX spend to spin up all kinds of interesting things, right? And mm. largely that's happening through SaaS, right? Course, so yeah. when you look at where analytics as a service, right? Big data platforms like what Alteryx provides as a subscription-based service to the market goes, we're not selling to the CIO. Guess who we're selling to? I'm yeah. heading, I'm selling to the CMO, I'm selling to the VP of Churn Analytics, I'm selling to the head of RF Engineering, Shadow I'm IT. selling to, <laughs> to, to real estate, um, the VP of real estate, and the reason why I'm doing that is because they have operating expense as part of running their business, discretionary budget. I yeah. am giving a very viable solution that is packaged as a service, right? And they're able to consume that without having a big infrastructure and CapEx spend and associated with permission. it. Yeah. They just say, hey, I'm so, over plan, so, I'm going to so, make this so investment. So this is why I don't think IT right. spend has actually declined. Yeah. It just so happens that the power base of who's actually spending on IT has moved you know, from the CIO to the line of business. And if you're a CEO, you're actually pretty excited by this, right? Because you can actually then control and say, hey, by the way, is this actually having a maternal and material impact to your business and the growth or you know profitability of your business as opposed to you know just the cost of doing business? Right. Hi, right, George. George Matthew th from uh, Altrix. Thank you very much for uh, sharing us with us your perspectives. Uh, we got to go. Uh, wrapping up the day here from from Strata and Hadoop World. This is Dave Vellante. We'll be right back with the Cube with our next guest right after this message. Dave, thank you again. Appreciate it. Thank you. See you. All right, George.